so welcome to Rust 101 part two. Okay, so, so this is the roadmap that we saw before. And uh, last time what I showed was a bit about types and then functions and control flow. And this time around, I'm going to be talking more about the borrow checker because there's a lot about that and it's quite deep. So a lot of it's just gonna be on borrow checker and then traits. Now I wanted to do small pointers, but um, I think it actually fit better into the next lecture when I talk about concurrency, especially. Uh, so I'll introduce small pointers then. Um, but yeah, so these two things are probably gonna take up a lot of time. They're probably the core aspects of, of Rust. So, um, oh, also a uh, quick note, the slides are now on my GitHub, including this lecture slides. Um, I got a few uh, questions asking whether or not we could, like you could mark, like write notes on the slides. So uh, that's now a thing. Um, and it's up on my GitHub page. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that up for like a moment or two. Um, if I go to change it and you're not done typing in for whatever reason, then just let me know and uh, I'll, switch back to it very quickly. So, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, it's Jordan Lloyd, uh, github.com slash Jordan Lloyd Hall slash Rust course. And then it's in the, um, I think it's lectures with a capital L. That's the folder it's in. You can find both of the slides there. Okay, I'm gonna move on unless anyone has any objections. Okay, cool. So yeah, last time we look, took a look at these three things, a pretty pretty standard stuff, variables, basic types, control flow and functions. Most of these ideas aren't particularly new, but they look, and they look similar to what you'd see in other languages, other more modern languages, especially. Um, but towards the end, I left you on a cliffhanger because we came across something that was very, very weird. So we, we saw this, right? And, and so we were talking about functions and uh, we create like this, you know, we create this struct called Tony, we fill it in. Uh, and then we set L to be the length of Tony's username. That's pretty standard. And we said this is equal to four and that's fine. And then I said, there was a problem with asserting that Tony isn't active. And it isn't with the fact that Tony isn't active. Tony still isn't active, but that won't compile. And that's where I left off. And this is the error message that the Rust compiler will give you. So, Rust error messages, once you know how to read them, are actually extremely helpful. They tell you pretty much exactly what's going on. I don't know if any of you are C++ programmers, but usually you have to sift through like 20, 30 lines of, <laughs> for anything complicated, you have to sift through like 20, 30 lines of error messaging before you get anything useful. And so here it says, move occurs because Tony has type user, which does not implement the copy trait. That's a lot of jumble, like nonsense here. It's absolute nonsense. But it says here we move the value. Okay, so what does move mean? And the value is trying to be used after move. And, and so Russ will tell you, hey, this is the error message and you can, that's how you get the error message. And you can also find it online. And so that's what I want to get into today because this move, moving the variable and then not allowing you to access it afterwards is how Rust actually keeps everything safe. It's how it keeps memory safe, threads safe, uh, lacks data races as a result of, and it's extremely core cool part. It, it's because of the borrow checker. So what we've just angered, what we've just annoyed is the borrow checker. And so what we can do is we can say, instead of passing the value, we can pass a reference to the value. And you've probably seen references before in C and C++, they, they don't look particularly new. You say up in length of username, instead of user, we now have of type ampersand user. So a reference to a user and then returns a use size. And then here in length of username, we pass in ampersand Tony. We're saying we're taking a reference to Tony and the Rust compiler is happy with this. So you can pass references to things, but not the actual object if you want to use the object afterwards. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about how references work in a moment, but first off, this is like a flow diagram. This is what is happening behind the scenes with both of our methods, with and without the ampersand, without the reference. And so here we have Tony is defined and it points to a struct, uh, a user struct. Well, it doesn't point to a user struct, it is the user struct, that's the value. 
And then when we call length of username, user now has that value and Tony goes out of scope. So Tony goes out of scope, but the struct still lives in user, which is, um, if, I, if I quickly go back to that, just so you understand what I'm referring to, user up here in the function, that's where, that's where, that, old, that's where that struct lives now. And it's been moved there. And then after, after length of username returns, then because user was defined in the scope, user also goes out of scope. Um, and now the actual struct is destroyed. So what's, been, what's happened there is that we've moved an object into a different function, into a different scope. It now has a different user, uh, sorry, a different variable associated with it. And then it goes out of scope and the struct can be freed. And so that's how you actually prevent memory leaks because you only ever have one owner of a variable. And when that, uh, sorry, one owner of an object in the variable, and when the variable goes out of scope, so does, the, so does the object, so does the struct. And so you never have memory leaks because you now know exactly when to deallocate the memory associated with the struct. And then if we look over to the part where we had references, so we have Tony, as the owner of the user struct. And then when we make a reference to Tony and we pass into the function, it's a reference that's created. So Tony still, well, the, the user struct still belongs to Tony. Tony's still the owner of the user struct, but now there's a reference to it. And that reference allows you to pass things along to functions and when length of username returns, it's actually the reference that goes out of scope, not the struct itself, not the owner of the struct. And so then you can continue using the struct like nothing happened at all. Now, when you do that, when you use a reference, can you mutate it? Does anyone know? Can you mutate that struct? So the one we just used isn't a mutable reference. It's an immutable reference. So yeah, you're, you're exactly correct. Why shouldn't it be able to mutate the struct? Why is that? Yeah? Exactly, exactly. You'd end up with data races if you're able to mutate that struct from within the reference. Um, because now like, you know, you could be calling a function that takes a reference to your struct and then, well, that, that function calls other functions and that fun other, those other functions call other functions again. And those functions might mutate your struct. And so you can know exactly what might be happening to your struct or to your object by knowing, hey, when I'm passing it into this function, it's an immutable reference, you can't change it. And so you know that when that function returns, your object hasn't changed at all. Okay. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to show you mutable references. So this is a mutable reference. And user now points to a mutable reference user. Uh, so we have a function called sign in user. And then we increment the sign in counter. And we set active to true. Why not? And then we pass in an ampersand mute. And we're saying, hey, have a mutable reference to user. And then this still works because we have a mutable reference that we've passed out. The owner still belongs in this scope. And so when this function returns, it's the reference that goes out of scope, not the actual struct itself. And then we can assert that Tony is now active and that um, his signing count has gone up by one and everyone's happy, everyone's happy. You can tell now whether or not your structs are gonna be mutated or your objects are gonna be mutated when you pass variables into them. And, and, and now you can keep track of what's happening. But there's, a, there's another issue again. So how many mutable references should you be able to have at once in order to prevent data races? How many things should be able to modify your data at the same time to prevent data races? Just one. Yes, exactly. Because if you have more than one, they may mutate it. Let's say they're in different threads or however, they may mutate it at the same time or close enough such that your data gets corrupted and that's a data race. 
So only one thing should be able to mutate your data at the same time. And how many mutable reference, how many immutable references should we have at the same time to prevent data races? As many as you want, because you know your data is never going to change when you have immutable references. How many immutable and mutable references should we be allowed at the same time? So, so just one immutable, uh, sorry, just one mutable reference. Yeah, that's exactly it. If you have an immutable reference, you're not allowed any, sorry, if you have a mutable reference, you're not allowed any immutable references because those immutable references don't know that the value is changing or they might not know that the value is changing. And as a result, um, okay. so, okay, I, I should be back online now. Sorry about that. That was weird. I wasn't expecting my computer to just suddenly disconnect from the internet and then my Zoom is left hanging. So the wonders of technology. Maybe that wouldn't happen if the Linux kernel was programmed in Rust. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, as we were saying before, you shouldn't be allowed a mutable reference and then any, sorry, a mutable reference and then any number of immutable references, zero immutable references to prevent those immutable references from accidentally, you know, of, to prevent the mutable references from accidentally creating data races. And this is exactly what the borrow checker accounts for. The borrow checker asserts that at compile time, oh, sorry, at compile time, you can only have like one or the other. And so I have two diagrams here. The borrow checker is not an easy thing to wrap your head around. I'll just tell you that, but it's worth understanding how it works. I think it's intuitive once you get your head around it. So I'm going to go through these in quite a bit of time. So you have an owned value and that's like, let's say the struct user right now. So we can see how it looks like. And then you can borrow it. That's what's called borrowing. When you pass a reference to it, you're borrowing the data. And so you, you can borrow it into a mutable reference or a immutable reference, but not both at the same time. You can't do both at the same time um, for the reasons we just explained. And then if you have a mutable reference, well, you should be able to say like, hey, I want you to, let's say you have a string and you want to say, hey, I'll push more data to the string when you have a mutable reference, that should be allowed. So you can, you can re-borrow re it, it's called, or you can move it. And the move semantics are exactly like we saw when Tony went out of scope. So you can move your mutable reference into a different uh, variable, and then that mutable reference goes out of scope. Um, I think we'll show that a bit later, so it's more clear. But it's definitely something you'll come to understand very well with practice. It gets very intuitive very quickly. And then, an immut so a mutable reference should be allowed to create immutable references, any number, as long as it's not being moved or reborrowed. So you have a mutable reference to something, you should be able to you know, pass it off to a function that only looks at the data and doesn't mutate it, that's, that's acceptable. And then you can copy an immutable reference. You can create any number of immutable references, that's fine, yes. Value from a reference and moving it. It's in, like, I don't know, the way I'm thinking right. is you have some variable, right? Instead of equal to user dot something. Mm -hmm. And if you do that with a mutable after duplicate, like my view is that the mutable case gets rid of the mutable reference after you've done that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't do so many Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so in the immutable case, I can say, hey, here's a reference to something. And then create a new variable which is which which is the same value as that reference, and, and so it copies the data, it copies the reference, um, and the first reference doesn't go out of scope. But if I were to, oh right, what's the difference between borrow and copy in this case? Yeah. Right, so you have to borrow it because then if you borrow it, you can't create another mutable reference. You can only create immutable references, and those immutable references can be copied. Mm -hmm. You're moving the value. Yeah, yeah. So if you create another mutable reference, it goes the first one goes out of scope. You can't move values in the mutable references and you can't copy them in the mutable case. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And um that's exactly it. Yeah. Any uh, so um 
in other words, and I have more of just a numerical diagram here, and we've been through this already. I asked a few questions and I go through answers. So you can either have, if you are the owner of a, uh, an object, you can either have any number of immutable references or one mutable reference. And if you are the owner of a mutable reference, you can either create one other mutable reference at a time or any number of um, immutable, sorry, any number of immutable references. And then if you are the owner of an immutable reference, you can, only, you can create any number of immutable references. Okay, that, that was a lot of words. I got to admit, it's, 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 a, it's a, how do you say, it? it's a set of rules that is, has been formally verified to, to prevent data races and to ensure memory safety. This is how you do it. And we'll get, we'll show a bit more examples because it's hard and it takes you a long time to like actually get used to the ideas. But that's, that's, how, that's just an overlook into it. I, I, I promise there'll be more, uh, more ideas, uh, sorry, more examples. And so here is an example of using the borrow hierarchy. So you have string, you, have, you create a string and it's, it's over Anakin, I have the high ground because I like using quotes a lot. And um, we create a reference to the string, right? Simple reference. And it's just a reference to the string. We create another reference to the string and then we print both of them. Does that compile? Does that compile? Does that Okay, yeah, that does compile because we have two immutable references and that's allowed by the borrow check, but the borrow check won't be, won't be mad at that. Okay. Um, yeah, does this work? So you've created a string, you create a reference to that string, and then you print out both the reference and the string. This one's a bit of a misnomer, but does this compile? Okay, it does compile because print line takes a reference to the uh, to, to the major s string. Yes. Yes. Yeah, when you create a variable, it's automatically mutable. You need to set. So uh, I went over this last time. But you need to say let mute s, and that's how you declare that a variable's in, uh, a variable is mutable. Yeah. Sorry, in the last slide, is it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, why doesn't it move? Yeah, why doesn't it move the right, because reference uh, references references. Sorry, immutable references are copyable. Are they sorry. Are they yeah, yeah. The compiler knows exactly, and copy is actually a trait, and we're going to get into that later. But basically, the compiler goes, "Okay, this is safe. I'm just going to copy the." The bytes associated with the first reference into the into the store of the second reference. Any more questions about this slide before I move on? No. Okay. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and this compiles and this works um, because you're just creating like two references because print line just accept accepts references to stuff. So that's fine. That's fine. This works. And what about this? Does this compile? So we create a string and it's a mutable string. We then create a mutable reference to that string. And then we try to create an immutable reference to that string right afterwards. And then we try to print them. Does this code compile? It doesn't compile, why not? Yes. And what can that cause? Yes, exactly. Now let's say it's a string, right? And you try to access the end of the string, the last five letters, but at the same time, your mutable reference gets rid of the, you know, gets rid of the last five letters, that calls a seg fault. So, you know, let's say they're on different threads. And it's really easy to get these onto different threads because of the way Rust works. The third lecture is gonna be about build tools and concurrency. Concurrency is an absolute breeze in Rust. It's so lovely. But yeah, yeah, exactly. You're, you're exactly right. That, that doesn't compile. And the error message it gives you is this. Cannot borrow S, so cannot create a reference to it. 
as immutable because it's borrowed as mutable already. So the Rust compiler knows you've angered the borrow checker and now you cannot, you know, you can't compile. Rust won't let you do that. It knows that it's wrong. It knows that, hey, your, your code is buggy naturally. If you try to put this into multiple threads, it ain't gonna work. So there you go, you can't do it anymore. And you see that it says um, mutable, oh yeah, and like I said, Rust errors, once you know how to use them or once you know how to read them are beautiful. So it, sh it shows you exactly what you've done. It's like, hey, Dumbo, this is, this, is where you, this is where you messed up, right? You've created a mutable borrow here, you've created a mutable reference, and then you've tried, sorry, a mutable, and then you try to create an immutable reference here, and then you try to use the mutable borrow again. Okay, cool. So finally we can get on the strings. <laughs> it's been a while to get here, but this is the primitive strings. These are string literals. So every time I've used strings before, I've said, I've said string dot from, oh sorry, string from, and then this string literal. Um, and so it creates an object because we hadn't gone onto references yet. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to accidentally introduce references before I'd explain what they are. So very short introduction. Uh, you create a reference to a string, says hello world, cool. And then you say, hey, and this is a slice, this is slice notation in Rust. You say, give me everything up to the fifth letter. Um, or get, give me the first five letters, you could say, uh, and put that into string two, and that works. So because there are two mutable references to the same string, that's allowed. Okay, and then if you print this, I should, probably should have added it at the end, but it'll say hello world, comma, hello. And that's, that's probably obvious. So we go on to traits. Now traits are a collection of methods that can be carried out on things that implement them, which it, it's a lot like interfaces, I guess you could say. It's a description of what something can do, not of what it is, right? And they just, <coughs> sorry. And they describe what a type, you know, uh, with that trait or implementing that trait is able to do. <coughs> so let's say we have user and I've just redefined it here. Uh, it's a struct and it, it, it's the same one we used before. It's not different in any way. <coughs> this is how you say, this is what user can do. This is, these are methods, these are just like, you know, the same way you have classes with associated data and their methods, um, except you can't inherit from this. So let's say we have user and it has a function called login and it takes a mutable reference to itself. And that allows you to say, you know, you create a user called Tony, let's say, you can say Tony.login and it returns a bool. And if it is active, so that's how you access fields in your struct, for example, if he is active, then you want to return false because let's just say the login failed. And else you say self.signin count, you increment that by one, you set active to be true, and then you return true saying that, hey, it's succeeded. And then we have a second uh, method. Uh, we'll say log out and it, it does the opposite. We'll say, if you're already logged out, then oh, if you're already not active, you return false. Otherwise you set active to be false and then you return true because it's succeeded. There's probably a better way I could have written that. Any questions about, so that, this, is how you do, this is how you do it. You say impl, which means implements. And so implements log uh, user. So it's just saying, this is, this is the set of methods that are associated with only user and the, only the user struct. And so then you can use that. And so this is an example of using those two methods. So you say, you create a new struct, you call it Tony, and you can say Tony.logout and then Tony.login. And then you, you can assert that he's active and he is now, that's great. Um, and that his sign-in count is increased by one. Okay, so standard stuff. Um, you're probably quite used to, even if the notation is different, the idea is that it's, sim it's very similar to object-oriented programming. Um, if you've used like Java before, it looks somewhat similar to that, I guess. And then, oh yeah, I tried to put it all onto one slide because I cut it off and it was a bit too small if I just did it all at once, but that's, that's how you do it all in one slide. Okay, so next. 
So it's the second look at traits. So you should be able to say, hey, this is a collection of, sorry, this is, this is a set of types that can implement this trait. And you have a trait here, and this is how you define traits. You say trait, and then the, the name of your trait, always with capitals. And then you say, hey, there's a method in this trait. So everything which implements it have to, has to implement this method. And you say, quote, let's just call it quote. And then you have a reference to self, an immutable reference to self, and then it returns a string. And so you have like Mace Windu and then Tony, let's just say, Mace Windu, he implements quote. So he can, he can call, you can call quote on a Mace Windu struct. Oh, and these are unit structs, by the way, up here. They don't have any size associated with them. So it's just a simple way you can like create types and say, you know, it's very fast if you want to use it for stuff like this. And so then you say, whenever you call quote, just return a string that says you are on this council, but we do not grant you the title of master or the rank of master. And then you can implement, implement quote for Tony. And then you can say he returns, oh baby. So if you've gone to his Haskell lectures, you know exactly. You've probably heard that a million times by now. Okay, so then you create two variables. So Mace Windu and then Tony. And then you was well, and then you just assert that this is just a test saying, like, hey, when I call windu.quote, it will return something. Well, it will return this string. And then when you call Tony.quote, it will return oh baby. Okay, are there any questions about traits so far? Anything confusing? Are, are, is it, have I delivered it well? Does it, do people understand what traits are? Is it pretty clear? Yes. So it, it's similar, it's similar only in a very surface level sense. They're probably more, more similar to, um, it's like a weird mix between, let's say, functional programming's traits and OOP's like, you know, uh, op, uh, data methods sort of combination. Why would you? I'm unfamiliar with type classes. As in, a trait that has a type class would be something that has functions to describe what you do, mm -hmm. and these are just your type by your type. Um, well, yeah, that's what impl does. Right. So when, when you call impl, you're saying this is, this is how your type implements this trait. And so it, it's similar in that sense, I guess. Um, and yeah, no, I, I understand what you mean now. And it, it's, it's a bit similar to that, I guess. Do, do you think it's not similar to that or? I don't know. Don't know? We'll, we'll, we'll go more into what traits are. I'm very much not too far into traits at the moment. So, okay, so this is how you use traits in functions. So you can say, these are two different ways of doing it, but they mean the exact same thing. You can say, hey, this is a function called print quote long. And it takes quoter, which is a reference to type T, where T implements quotes. So that's what these angle brackets do here. They say, what is T? Well, T is something that implements these methods, right? And so because of that, it's now generic over all, all things that implement quote. You can take a reference to anything which implements quote, and that function will accept it. And it's type safe at compile time, which is brilliant. And <laughs> then there's another way of doing it, which is with, this is the, this is a shorter way, right? This is the way that it, it makes it a bit easier to read. You can say with the top one, uh, you use that for longer things when you, or when you want to implement several, or when you want several variables to implement exactly the same or be of the exact same type. That's how you do it up top. So T is quote, and let's say you have quota one, quota two. If you say quota one is a reference to T then quota two is a reference to T, it implements the same type. So it, it is of the same type, yes. It's so, so no, object oriented programming was a mistake. I will say that on stage. It's pretty similar to interfaces. That's why I wanted to introduce it in that way. But it's not the same. Yes.
Yeah, yeah, ex exactly, exactly. Yeah, sorry? Yeah, so like, structs and actors, like, uh, it's like just a collection of indicators and fields, and it has yeah, to model all of these. Right, yeah, but then you have the triangle problem with object oriented programming. Yeah. And, and traits don't allow for that. So, so, so that, uh, yeah, object oriented programming wasn't a mistake because, because, you know, I, I hate the methodology entirely. It's because people use it incorrectly. For message passing systems, microservers, et cetera, et cetera, I love object oriented programming. I, I think it's the way to go. But, but for doing stuff like this, for describing what an object can do, people, people often confuse it. And I think procedural programming is actually better for, for than object oriented programming in many cases. So people misuse object. I, I'm a, my first language, well, all of my first languages are object oriented. So I come from an object oriented background and I still think it's a mistake. Yeah, sorry, questions. Yeah. Uh, how many different quantum things if something is Oh, yeah, no, I'll get on to that. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I saw another question somewhere. I don't know exactly where it was. Does anyone have a question? No? Okay, cool. And so, yeah, uh, and then this is, sorry, we'll go on to the second way to do it. So you say quota is a reference to something that implements quote, right? And so it, they mean the same thing. They're exactly the same in functionality. Uh, and then we can say, let windows equal to mace window, and then print quote long with a reference to window and then short and they'll print the same thing. So it's not different in that sense. And then, oh, so anything else about this before I move on? Pretty surface level, but might have a few questions. Okay, great. So let's say we have a trait, which is name. And so you can get the name from something which implements trait, uh, this trait. Pretty simple. So we have a method, which is name, and it returns a string <coughs> and takes in an immutable reference to itself. And then we implement name for mace window, and then when you call name, it just returns Mace Windu Jedi Master. And then you can, this is how you do multiple, multiple traits in a function declaration. And so you say print quote, and then the angle brackets, T is a type which implements name and quote. So it does, it should do all the functionality of both. And then you say quote is a reference to this type, and then print line, the quote and then the name following that. And so it's a pretty simple example, but that's how you do things that implement both. And so you have your trees are now, sorry, your types are now, or your, your, your traits are now trees and you can't have the triangle problem, which is great. So things can implement downwards, but like not together like that when you implement them. And so, and so that's how you pass in variables to functions which implement more than one trait. Any questions about that? Oh, great, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? So when you call like- When you call quota dot quote. Yeah. Yes, it'll create two immutable references, which is allowed because quota in, in itself is an immutable reference. But um, so, so that, that, that's allowed, that's okay. And um, yeah, you'll just get two strings and this will print, um, you are on the council, but we do not grant you the rank of master or whatever that was, dash Mace Windu Jedi Master. And so that's how, that's how you implement, that, that's how you pass variables to functions which implement more than one trait and it makes it, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I forgot more questions, go on. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, we need to post You want a trait that, yes, yeah, we'll go on to that. We'll go on to that. That's, I think, the next topic. Sorry? Why is name yellow? Because for some reason, my font setter decided it was so. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I'm using Minted, and for some reason, its styling isn't always perfect. It gets it right most of the time, which is why I use it. It's really easy to use, but sometimes it's not perfect. Um, yes, and you had another question? Sorry? Uh, because quota itself, so for dot quote, or oh, okay, I'll use the example of dot name. So dot name, this is a special reference that you pass in called ampersand self. 
And so uh, up in dot name at the top. And so when you say quota dot name, you're, that's just, it's a, it's a shorthand way of not saying name or, or not fully qualifying it. So that's, it, it's more of just, it'll eventually be converted to the same thing, but that's, it's just shorthand. It just makes it easier to work with. Uh, and it is converted, so it does take in a immutable reference to to the quota. Okay, so yes. Mm -hmm. Does it pass the references that it was trying to take as dictionaries, or does it specialize the function for each given function? Mm. Yeah, that's that. That's very good. So, um, in this case the compiler would have to monomorphize it. So monomorphization is when the compiler creates separate implementations of the same function so that you can work with different types and still know all of the relevant sizes at compile time. And so this is, this is how you do it. That, that's a very low level concept. It's more about compiler optimizations. You don't really need to understand it, I guess. And where you, when you, so for example, when you only use it once, well, and it'll also likely be inlined. So you produce a bit more code, but um, yeah, yeah. So monomorphizes it. So this function is sort of like created for every for every type you pass in, so that it knows where like where to access the relevant uh, uh, functions, like quote and name. So like the, we're using a, oh a pointer. Do you mean a reference or? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a box of type T. I think it, I, I'd have to check this on Godbolt. I use Godbolt a lot for like figuring out this stuff, but I, I think it would, in order to know exactly where, hmm. yeah, I'll get back to you on that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but so the, yeah, the question was, Basically, if does it always does it always create a new function for each type you pass in? And uh, the answer is I don't know yet, but I will check. Uh, I, I imagine I imagine sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Cool. So um, yes, this is another way of. Oh yeah. So yeah, this is an example. Sorry, where we say. Well, sorry, where we pass print quote a reference to Tony. What happens here? Does it compile? So, so for, ref for reference, this might give it away entirely. We've implemented quote for Tony, but we've only implemented name for Mace Windu. So when you pass print quote, which takes a type which implements both name and quote, Tony, does it um, but does it uh, does it compile? Does Rust let you do that? No. no. Okay. Yeah. No. Exactly. And it's error message. I only only showed it. It's obvious, but I just love the error messaging system. It's so nice. So it says the trait name is not implemented for the type Tony, and it's required by a bound introduced introduced in the print quote. So it's saying, hey, you give me this function. This function requires a type which implements these traits. And like you've given me something which only implements like, you know, not all of the necessary traits in order in order for me to know what to do. And so it says required by a bound in print quote, and this is a help. And it points you, it points to you exactly what trait you need to implement for that variable. And so it's quite nice in that sense, yeah. How a lot of traits is possible to make them one? Yes, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. You, um, I'll introduce like. Uh, so basically, you can create um, type aliases. Um, I'll show a demo of that, actually. I don't think I have a slide of it for some reason. But yeah, you can create type aliases, um, and that helps a lot uh, when you want to reduce the size of this, uh, the sizes of these like uh, function declarations. Okay, and then it'll tell you at the bottom, hey, here's, here's a good explanation of exactly what you've done wrong and how you can fix it. Okay. Everyone understand that? Good. Cool. So we have a different way of um, 
so, so we have like two different ways where you can say what types implement what traits. And it's because sometimes like having it in those angle brackets between the name of the function and the arguments passed in, that can get really long if you're dealing with very complicated types. And um, for example, like function, the function trait, which I will get onto later. Um, and so this, this is just another way of, like these two, func these two functions are equivalent. They both compile to the same thing. They both, uh, they both mean the same thing and they'll print out the same thing at the end. So you can say print quote and takes in a type T, um, sorry, with type T uh, and takes in a quota which is referenced to type T where T implements name and quote. So it's just a different way of notating it. And um, uh, yeah, just, just so I just wanted you to be aware that that exists basically. Uh, it's not particularly deep. It's just a different way of doing the same thing. Okay, super traits. So let's say instead now you want to get rid of the old quote trait and you want to say, hey, quote is now defined only on things which implement name. On only on things which have a name, that's, that's the only time you can actually make a quote. Uh, you, you, you can implement quote on it. And so you have name. Uh, take, it's the same name as before. It's the same trait. And then you say trait is quote. Oh, sorry, uh, you create a new trait called quote. And it is bounded by name. So everything which implements quote now also needs to implement name. And you'll see a really good example of where this shows up later. And so you have like two functions, let's say, quote, which takes in a self, and this is an un un unimplemented method, and it returns a string just as before. And then like a function speak. And function speak takes in a reference to self, and it's already implemented in the trait. So anything which implements quote, sorry, and when you write the uh, function quote, for that, uh, for that trait, then you automatically get speak as well. So you don't have to re-implement speak. You can overload that function, that's okay, but it's already there for you as long as you have both name and the quote function of quote. Okay, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me know if you're not following along because probably is very likely the case I can say things in a better way. Okay, so we have a, more examples of a, oh, sorry, this, this is how you'd implement, let's say, this is how you'd use those super traits. So you have a struct dog, it's a unit struct as before. Um, you implement name for dog, and let's just say it returns dog. And then when you quote it, it says woof. I guess that's what dogs say. Um, yes? Yeah. No, um, you can't do that. Um, the compiler would scream at you saying, hey, you haven't implemented name yet. Um, I'm pretty sure that's important for a reason. I think I've had the same question before. I'll have a think about, because I'm pretty sure I, I read a really good answer online for why you can't do that, why you can't just implement quote with the function name inside of it already. But I'll get back to you on that. Anyway, so yeah, now you've implemented quote for dog and you can do that. Be oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. I will complain you. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Yeah, yep. If two functions have the same name, you can sort of ambiguously reference them with like fully qualifying it. Like yeah, yeah, by fully qualifying so it, yeah. Weird, Sorry? So no, it does allow it, but um, does it allow it? No, I don't think it does allow it. We, we'll do a quick example of that in a bit, actually, just, just so we're very sure. But yeah, I don't think it would allow it, maybe. Pretty sure at least. It's something I should know, but you just never come across it. Never try to implement <laughs> the two of the same name, just as bad practice. And so um, then you can say, let dog is just dog. And then, you know, dog.speak and it'll print out woof said the dog or whatever. So it's quite standard. And let's say we implemented, well, we have a new struct called cat or a new type called cat. And we implement quote for cats. Does this work? No? Why doesn't it work? Anyone know why it doesn't work? Well, you need to implement name as well, exactly. The compiler complains, 
I'm pretty sure the error message is. Yeah, so the trade bound cat you know, name is not satisfied. And so you try, it points to you exactly, hey, you've tried to implement quote for cat, but quote requires name here. You haven't implemented that yet. So go do that, please. Yes? Yeah, yeah it doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, there are actually no objects. So, uh, sorry, um, in this case. No, 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 they're different structs. But uh, importantly, here, right? So, let's say we had user like before and you created like, you know, uh, uh, you know, user one and user two, and then you create new structs to them. They're different structs and they exist on the, on the stack. Sorry? Yeah, it doesn't have any fields. And because it doesn't have any fields, it actually doesn't take up any memory space. So this, this is more, how do you say, like when it comes to compile, Rust knows, hey, I'm not gonna allocate any memory for this because it is of size zero. And instead um, it just optimizes all of that away. So this actually doesn't take up any memory. When you call cat.name, it literally just calls the fully qualified name. So cat colon colon, uh, and then uh, let's say name or quote. Um, yeah, it's a, does that answer your question? They're not the same struct, they're just empty. They're the unit type, they're empty. They don't have anything in them. Yeah, so pointer quality is unsafe. Uh, you don't wanna do that. Um, you can do it. So if you have two immutable references, you can say as pointer, and then you can you, you can check for equality, but uh, you have what's known as partial equality, and then full equality on in Rust is actually just like you know uh, they, they they describe the data inside of the inside of the uh, types instead of the like pointers to them because that can be unsafe. Does that make sense? Uh, you couldn't do that. No, you couldn't. You you couldn't say are those two dogs equal? And I'll get on to why. Uh, it's because you haven't implemented a trait known as partial equality, which tells Rust, hey, you can say equals equals, and it works. So right now you can't say are these two dogs equal, for example. Yeah. Um, because in C, you know, there's things that are because there's no size. Okay. Hold on, that's a good answer. Uh, any, yep. I did that because then you can, because I did that to introduce, yeah, you're right, you're completely right. You could have quote just be, like have no arguments that's completely allowed in this case. Um, but then you need to say, it, you, need to, uh, you need to send in the fully qualified uh, name to that function. I'll show you what I mean because fully qualified might not make sense to many of you actually. Um, so if I, I say this, yeah, cool. Okay, back up to here. So for example, if I make this bigger, is that big enough? No, that big enough? Should be big enough now. Okay, so let's say I have like um, a struct dog, for example, and then we impl um, dog. So we implement this method to dog. And then we have a function, we will call it name, and it doesn't take in any arguments, but returns a string. And then let's just say string uh, dog. So the name of the dog is dog. Uh, in order to call this, oh, it's remembered from last time. That's nice. <laughs> um, in order to call this, I have to say dog name. I can't say because it doesn't have anything associated with it. And it doesn't require that um, 
you know, an instance of this object already exists. So you have to use what's known as, as a fully qualified name. That's how that works. Uh, I think it's similar in other languages as well. Uh, so you say dog colon colon name, open bracket, close bracket, and you need to balance a few parentheses. And then that'll, that'll, that will return a uh, dog in this case. So if I, if I run it, hedging my bets, but I haven't made an, an error, shouldn't have, but yeah, so number dog. I don't know why I put number there. It should have been name, but but yeah, that, that's how you'd that's how you define and use uh, methods which don't have which don't take a reference to self. Okay, because uh, you're not doing anything on the actual object. It just belongs. It's a method that belongs to that object, and that's what that's when we use string from. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're saying string that there is a method in string. Uh, and it's called from, and it takes in the uh, string literal that we were talking about before and returns a string. And so th that's how you do it, yeah? Self is a keyword, yeah, 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 exactly. No, um, yeah, self is, because we don't apply a name to it. Otherwise, Rust would require you to uh, apply a name to it. So you'd have to say like, you know, self is um, of type like, you know, dog or cat. But no, um, that's a special, a special, uh, a special argument to a function. Any more questions? Cool. Yeah. So we've looked over this, and, and so that, that's pretty much like the majority of traits it, it, um, when it when it comes to like the the one hundred one stuff. Maybe two hundred one. We get a bit more into it, but um, we've already seen the most basic type. Oh, sorry. Has has Joanna, has pizza arrived yet? Yes. It has. Okay, so I didn't notice the time. We'll stop here then for a pizza break. Uh, and then we'll we'll come back and we'll continue with it afterwards. So now we want to, oh, I got back to this. So super traits. Okay. So this is an important aspect of Rush, Rust. It's called constant generics and allows you to have an integer or well, yeah, an integer value as part of a type. And we've already seen this. I've actually, I, I sneakily snuck it in the last time when we took a look at arrays, because this is the type annotation for arrays. You say you have an I32, and then, so it's an array of I32s, semicolon five. And that five is the size of the array. And so then you have a constant generic in there, because now Rust, for the entirety of the, compilation process knows exactly how big all of your arrays on the stack are going to be all the time and it's part of the it's part of the part of the type of the array and we can use this for example here so this is a function called cumulate and in its type uh it's yeah sorry in, in its type signature it has const n colon u size and so we're saying hey this is a constant uh, sorry, a, a constant u size called n, and at compile time, I guarantee you'll know what that is. And then you take an immutable array of i32s and also the size n. So now this function knows what the size of your array is, and then it returns i32. You know, it returns you know an array of the same type, and that's the only way you can return arrays like that um, as part of functions is by knowing their size as well. And so then this, th what this does is it, it creates a mutable uh, I32 called sum and then goes through all of the array, accumulates sum you know, as it passes through, and then also sets the value of, of um, the, current, the current index to uh, sum. And so then you can say accumulate all ones, so 10 ones. Um, that's how, you, yeah, uh, I've covered this last time. And then you, so now we know that um, all of these ones, when you pass it to accumulate, is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Standard accumulation. And this isn't super important until you get very, very into Rust. But I thought I'd let you know that this also exists, and it, we've already used it. We've used it for um, we've used it for arrays already. So, uh, are there any questions about this? Because this isn't this is something you've probably not seen before. It's sort of like dependent types if you've studied 
uh, any uh, uh, any type theory. Uh, but it's not at the same time. It's just it's just a glimpse into dependent types and allows you to, allows Rust to know exactly what's going on all the time when it comes to uh, types which might be of different sizes. Yes. Does it have to be determined at compile time or? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, like, in terms of, like, is it essentially both the same as C plus template? Um, I'm unfamiliar, not entirely familiar with C plus plus templates, but I'll. So, uh, is your question like, what are you expecting the behavior to be? Yeah, it monomorphizes it as well. That's right. Sorry? It cannot work. Well, um, user, yeah, yeah, exactly. So arrays, you have to know the sizes of arrays at runtime, uh, at compile time anyway. Um, you can have dynamic arrays called vectors and they're called vectors in C++ as well. And they are, they're global arrays, but yeah, yeah. Um, I think in the C and C++ specification, you, sh you should always know the size of your arrays at compile time. But I know that a lot of C and C++ compilers will allow you to bypass that. Um, it's the same with Java, but you, you can do it in Java as well, have a, uh, a runtime. Uh, yeah, you, you can have your the size of your array um, uh, known at runtime instead of compile time, but it's a bit harder in Java. Yeah, it causes issues. That's why you don't want this. Because if you don't know the size of your arrays, how do you perform bounds checking? Like, and you have to have bounds checking or else now your code is unsafe. You could seg fault buffer overflow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, have, you, you have to have bounds checking. And so you need to know at compile time what the size of your arrays are. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, it's an object, it's, it exists on the stack. You can, you, you can't, unless you're using unsafe Rust, you can't access, you can't manipulate the pointer directly. You can create references to it, but references are different from pointers. But, but for, the, for the purposes of programming, they're pretty much the same, but you usually don't use pointers uh, because things can get very unsafe very quickly. You just use references which say, hey, I'm a reference to something. It's not, it's not the same as pointers. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna move on in, you know, for, for time six. Um, so we have a problem with references now. And so uh, the problem with references is that, well, this actually works, I, I'll, I'll tell you that. But like S, so you have this function return slice and um, it takes in an S, which is a reference to a string and returns a reference to a string. And it just returns the first five characters of the string. Right, and this works. This will compile, and the you know um, it'll it'll return hello exactly as expected, and everything will be dandy. But let's say we had this function instead. Okay, and we have this function. It takes two references to strings and returns a reference to a string. And so um, this just returns the largest as a simple simple check for a simple partial uh, ordering check on the length of the two strings. Um, and then you say, hey, S1 is string from hello world, S2 is string from wow, and then return the largest string of S1 and S2 and assert this equal to hello. Will this compile? Will it compile? Does anyone know? Yeah? Right, yeah, exactly. So, so I'll show you the error message first and then we'll disassemble the error message and, and show what it means. So this is the error message the Rust compiler would give you. It says expected named lifetime parameter. 
That's that's a bunch of gibberish. What does that mean? What does lifetime mean? What what are these? What do these symbols mean? Help. This function's return type contains a borrowed value, so it's a reference to something. But the signature does not say whether uh, it is returned from S1 or S2. Okay, so you take in two references to a string, and you return a reference to another string, and it's either one of the references. How can that be a problem? How can it be a problem when you take in two references to something and return one of the references? In what situation could could occur that would cause that to be an issue at runtime? Yeah. If one of the strings goes out of scope before the other, ah. you can't know how long the string which it returns is in scope. Exactly. That's that's exactly it. So the issue is with scopes, because you're taking in two uh, exactly as was explained. I'll, uh, I'll say a bit. I'll say it again. So you take in two references to strings, and you return one of the references. What if one of these references goes out of scope before the other? How do you know when this returned reference is going to go out of scope? Because if, if they go out of scope and you try to access the returned reference, it's a dangling pointer, effectively. You, you'll try to access it, and something will go wrong, because now the one of, well, the pointer, the data to which you, you are returning a pointer to no longer exists. And so Rust actually, Rust actually gives you a little hint here. It says, consider introducing a named lifetime parameter. And that's that little, that little tick, A, and then you have tick A's after the, re sorry, after the ampersands, but before the type of the reference. So it's very strange. And so I'll show you a bit about how Rust actually works behind the scenes. So Rust has this thing called lifetimes, and it's kind of like scopes, but it is distinct. It says how long a reference to something is expected to live for. Right. Now, some very common lifetime patterns are actually completely elided, right? Because let's say you take in a reference to a string and then you return a string. What's the lifetime of that string, or that reference, the return reference? Can anyone guess what, what the lifetime of this returned reference is? When, is? when does the returned reference go out of scope? Is it before the input reference? Is it after the input reference? Or is it the same time? So it's the same time, yeah, exactly. Because that way you know whenever you access the returned reference, it's going to be safe because the data you're, you're pointing to still still there, still there. And so this is actually what... There's an intermediate representation in the compiler. The compiler expands everything out so it's easier to deal with later. This is actually what the compiler sees, like when it's actually working. You have this type parameter called dash A, which is a lifetime. It says how long something is going to live for. And then you say, hey, that A, it's bounded by this string. As long as this string lives, this Life, oh, sorry, the, uh, this lifetime will also uh, you know, will be active. It'll be an active lifetime. And then when you're returning, you're returning something with the same lifetime. And so if I go back to my example with, with this return slice under this newfound knowledge, um, you're, you're passing in Hello World. And whilst Hello World is still alive, you can access the reference to hello world and i'll show you i'll show you a time where that doesn't work soon okay so, so does that make sense yes the reference yeah the reference goes out of scope at the same time exactly yeah. so when the when the data you're borrowing goes out of scope so does your reference Right, and that's all lifetimes do. They tell you when your data is going to be in scope. They don't do anything else. You cool with that? Any other questions? No. Okay. Move on then. I'll, it, it does get you do explain a bit more. I do. I will explain a bit more as we continue to use it. And so this is exactly what I'm talking about, right? So you have. You say, hey, this is a slice to a string. Uh, sorry, this is a reference to a string. We'll call it slice. Then in a new scope delimited by these angle uh, by these uh, yeah, curly braces you say let s is equal to string dot from hello world 
And then we say slice is actually return slice, so that same function we have had before, taking in a reference to S, that string that we just created. But slice still exists up here. So slice is defined up here in the outer scope and then defined in the inner scope. So what happens if we try to print slice or if we try to assert that slice is the same as hello world? What's the compiler gonna say? Is it gonna say, yep, that's cool. It's false because there's no data in here. Or is it gonna say, mm -mm, nope, it's gone out of scope. Your reference no longer applies. It doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. Which one? It goes out of scope, the reference goes out of scope. And the error the compiler gives you is this. So you, so S does not live long enough is, is what it says. It said slice uh, is equal to return slice of that, that reference to S. Borrowed value does not live long enough because S is dropped right outside of the scope while still borrowed by the, by the, by the reference we defined outside of the scope. And then the issue is borrow is used after the scope. Uh, and so, and so, sorry, uh, yeah, borrow is used later here. So the reference we've created, but now has gone out of scope is trying to be used afterwards and that's illegal. Ross doesn't allow you to do that because Ross doesn't allow for dangling pointers. Okay. And so we can modify return larger string exactly in the way the Rust compiler tells us to by saying, hey, the reference we're gonna return lives for as long as, sorry, uh, is the same, sorry, the, the lifetime of the returned reference is the same as the shortest of S1 and S2. So if S1 goes out of scope first, then the reference goes out of scope as well. And if S2 goes out of scope first and the return reference goes out of scope as well, that actually doesn't depend on, doesn't depend on which value you return. Yeah. In this case, yeah. Um, yes, and it's a really weird, um, yeah, I, I have, do you have a use case where that would be valid? No, I just thought that would be. You can apply bounds to these types, uh, to these lifetimes. Um, although it's finicky because um, if you try to do it, it doesn't change how long your returned reference lives for, but like now the two variables you're referencing have to exist in the same scope and it just gets a bit ugly. It's not something I could think of a use case. It might exist because you can do it, right? Um, but maybe it's just a product of um, applying bounds to lifetimes. But anyway, any other questions about lifetime? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How come that doesn't mean that they have the same lifetime? Uh, because you're just saying they're bounded by each other. So you're just saying, hey, this is the shortest of the two lifetimes. Right. Yeah. Is there a way to define multiple lifetimes? Yes. Yeah. So at the in your type signature, you can say tick A, comma tick B. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it lives for as long. So that's how you. That's exactly how you define um, that your reference lives as long as one of your references, but not the other. Um, yeah. What operation can it do with lifetimes? Right. It's a bit outside of a one hundred and one, in my opinion. But you, there's. So after this, uh, after this lecture, I'm going to give you a. Which ends shortly. I'm going to give you something to go over um, in your spare time if you're interested in actually practicing Rust. Because Rust, you can learn it. You can't really learn it academically is the issue. So you need you need to have practice. And um, there's a really good course there. It's called Rust Lings. But I'll, I'll show you a link to that afterwards. But um, yeah, and you'll have to play around with lifetimes as one of them. And I recommend you look up the documentation I, or, or um, some Rust by example books or uh, uh, sort of online books, but I couldn't, I, did, I wouldn't have enough time in a lecture series to go over all of the finicky details with lifetimes. So yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I will go over that now. I'll go over that now. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to move on if that's okay.
Cool. Static life size. <laughs> exactly, exactly as you asked. So there's a special lifetime. It's called the static lifetime, and it looks like tick static. It's a keyword, uh, whereas the rest are variables. Its purpose is to inform the compiler when something will live as long as the whole program. So if you know assembly, it lives in the dot data section. Um, and a good, a good example of this is actually string literals. So there is a, so this wouldn't compile before when I, when I said string dot from like before that it wouldn't compile because S went, sorry, um, because you're creating a uh, reference to S uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the example just so I, I'm not talking from my memory uh, alone. Yeah, so here, um, we're saying S is string from hello world. So that's, that's a struct and it goes out of scope with this scope that it's in. And then you create a, a slice, which is a reference to uh, that, that string object or the data inside of the string object. So when it goes out of scope, so does the lifetime of slice and then slice can't be accessed afterwards. But because, oh, because string literals are stored in the data section, they actually exist forever. And so this is valid. You can do this because it has a static lifetime. And I will show you an example of, oh, uh, so yeah, like in most languages, they're put in, uh, strings are put into the uh, data section string literals and are compiled with the assembly file um, at strings are references to the data in the data section. So the string that lives in the data section. That's why you can't just have a type called string. You can only have a type reference to a string. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, as long as as long as a reference exists, to, sorry, as long as a reference exists to that string, then yeah, yeah. But um, for example, like, let's say S was defined inside of this scope, then you wouldn't be able to access it. That string would be lost afterwards because all references to it have gone up the scope. So you wouldn't be able to really access it again. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah, if, yeah, of course you can. Yeah, yeah. Because it's immutable, it's in the data section. So, so it does perform that optimization. I think, I think that's a very reasonable optimization to make. Yes, okay. Okay, so um, yeah, this is how you'd use a static lifetime. So let's say, as so unlike before, instead of taking in a reference to a uh, string, you actually don't take in any object at all to a function. And then you just want to return a string. Well, Russ would scream at you saying, hey, I don't know how long this string is meant to live for. And so what you can say is actually, this is a static string. I'm going to return a string with, uh, sorry, reference to a string with static lifetime. And that's what that is. You return O baby. Okay, I have five minutes left. I'll try to finish on time, I promise. Uh, and, and the Rust compiler will allow you to do this. And so traits from the standard library. I'm going to go over a few traits, uh, and tell you what they do and give you an example. I'm going to do this very quickly because the Rust documentation is very good and you can look it up yourself. So clone. So clone is a trait that allows you to perform a deep copy into an object. So for example, you can clone a string because string has data allocated onto the heap. And if you want to make a copy, if you want to duplicate that data, then you need to explicitly call copy. And so you define a function called cell, uh, sorry, clone. And that's what you have to define. Clone from is already defined for you once you have clone. So it's it's, a, it's already defined as soon as you have the clone method. And an example of this is implementing it for user. So clone for user, you give back a user and then you just say self.active and then username, which is a string, you clone that. Email, which is a string, you clone that. And then sign in count and active, you can just copy them over. I'll get into copy in a moment. Um, yeah, and you return a user. Does that make sense? Cool. So it's just how you copy things. Oh, that's gone a bit below, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, um, there is another way actually. You don't always have to do that because that's actually quite a long way of, you, didn't, you don't want to have to write out the whole copy implementation every time you want to use copy on an object. So you have a macro for that. And Rust's macros are extremely powerful. They allow you to just say, hey, derive clone over this struct 
and it'll do it for you automatically. And you can, you can look into how it does that, but it's very powerful. The only requirement is that every field or every associated type with that struct also needs to implement call, uh, clone. Okay, yep. Primitives, sorry, primitives do implement clone. They also implement another trait, which I'm gonna get onto in a moment, which is better than clone for some things. Okay, so the copy trait. And so clone is copy super trait. So everything which implement copy also have to implement clone. And basically what it means is that you can implicitly duplicate the object, right? And so you can, uh, I'll give you an example of it. Uh, it's actually a marker trait. You don't have to implement anything. Basically, all you're telling the Rust compiler is, hey, you can, you can duplicate this, that'll be okay. And so that's all that does. It doesn't do anything except when you, when, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example actually. Yeah, yeah. so this is an example of copyable uh, ob, uh, ob, uh, objects, yeah, data. So you have X is equal to 42 and let Y is equal to X. Now I've shown you before where you do this with a struct, it doesn't work. But in this case, X is actually copied into Y and both X and Y still live. Now a bit of, bit of a sanity check, you don't wanna do this for anything which allocates onto the heap. Any large data structures, don't copy them. You can copy them, I, dis I disagree with it. Uh, it's considered bad hygiene to copy large structures because when you're programming with those large structures, you can sort of miss out when you're copying and when you're close, uh, sorry, when you're actually copying them. And that can lead to a lot of data duplication uh, unnecessarily so sometimes, and you just don't want to, it. Um, it makes your program slower. So only do it for things which are allocated on the stack alone, no heap objects, please. Yes. Uh, copy can't be introduced with every uh, struct, but you can still write try implement copy. Yeah, yeah. Is that not on safe operation? Can you implement copy? No, you can implement copy for every struct if you want to, as long as all of its fields implement clone. Sorry, as long as its fields also implement copy. Okay, yeah. So oh, actually, so no, sorry, sorry. All your struct needs to do is implement clone, and then you can also implement copy. If you've got a struct which has a pointer to keep allocated, mm -hmm. and then you, you copy it, you've now got two pointers the same. No, 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 um, because copy ju is just clone. That's all, uh, let me go back to the trait definition. So implements clone. So it's actually doing a deep copy, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, sorry, a deep clone. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it duplicates all of the associated data, but you're just telling the compiler, hey, I'm okay with cloning this object implicitly rather than always explicitly. So small things are on the stack like uh, maybe arrays, because you don't want large arrays on the heap, a uh, stack, you want them in the heap. Um, string literals, that's okay. Um, you can do uh, references that you can copy them, that's fine. Um, some structs, which are small, you might, and uh, aren't on the heap, you might want to copy them, that's fine. But um, yeah, I wouldn't copy anything that's on the heap personally. Yeah? Does that mean copy could do it after operations? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a marker. Yeah? Yeah. Copy is like the X and Y example to say that you're, you're allowed to yeah. copy this. So if I'm, and if I. If you later do that, it'll just assume, okay, I'm just copying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if I implemented uh, cl sorry, clone and copy on a struct, uh, then um, uh, if I implemented both clone and copy on a struct, and then I just set X and Y to be equal to these structs, or sorry, X to be equal to that struct, and then Y to be equal to X then it would copy the struct rather than move it. So, so then it like makes it how like, you do it most other programming. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. But Rust likes to be explicit when you're doing deep copies, uh, deep clones, sorry, yeah? Um, how are copies handled in terms of mutability? Well, it's a deep duplication. So your object is still, so you don't mutate the original object. Because clone, which which call, which the compiler sort of like calls, uh, takes in an immutable reference to self. So you duplicate all the data, even if it's in the stack. Okay, I'm gonna try try closing off soon. Uh, 
unless you make it mutable, that's fine. You can say let x is equal to, um, yeah, let mute x is also fine. Debug trait. So it allows you to print stuff out to the terminal in a programmer facing, uh, like in a programmer facing way. Don't worry about this because most of the time you can implement, uh, you can implement uh, debug using macros as well. And that's pretty much the only way you want to implement debug. Um, oh, sorry, that says default. It's also meant to say debug. So if all of the associated types also implement debug, and most do, it's, it's considered good practice to implement debug for all of your traits, sorry, all of your types, then you can implement debug on the type as well. I'll give an example of this. So you derive debug on this user struct, it's the same as before, and then you create a new user called Tony, and then you print Tony, and this is what it'll give you. So it, it's not very pretty, but it's functionally exactly what, uh, exactly what you wanna see if you're trying to debug your code. That's what you want to see. You want to see all of the associated data with an object. Okay. Most things do implement uh, debug. Not every, pretty much. You only implement. Um, there's another one for user facing. It's called display, but I didn't want to get into how it works because you have to implement it yourself. It's meant to be the prettier version for user facing applications. But I recommend you look that up yourself if you if you're interested. And the default trait. So sometimes it's a bit like finicky and like you have massive code if you're always like defining user like I've been defining it. So um, instead you want to create new objects to save on like code size. And so you implement the default trait and default returns self. And much like before, I'm oh, sorry, uh, debug implements the type self with capital S, which is what you're implementing it on by the way. So if you implement it for cat, cat self would actually be of type cat. And then you say, default user is equal to user, the fully qualified default. And that gives you all of the defaults for the, uh, for the items uh, of user for its fields. And so Booleans are default to false, uh, using it, uh, sorry, strings default to empty, and then uh, U64s, yeah, U64s uh, default to zero. But you can also do it to save on uh, duplication when you actually want to define something that's like where you want to define some fields but not others and you just want the rest of the fields to be default for a large structure example you can say hey tony is equal to new user um, username is equal to tony email is equal to obaby42 at haskell.org and then just fill in the rest of the defaults so that's active which defaults to false as we can see there and sign and count which defaults to zero so when you're creating a new user they're not active and they haven't signed in yet, so that, that's fine. That's a use case for it. The from and into traits. Yeah, okay, I, I have five minutes left on my lectures. I only have like three more slides. So you can explicitly convert one object to another using the from and into traits. And it's a function from that takes type T, which is what you're implementing it from. Sorry, uh, is, is, which is what you're converting it from. And then it returns the type that you're implementing it for, so self in this case. And so whenever you implement from, you actually automatically get into for free as it's defined for all types that implement from. So you can look that up online. It's definition is pretty interesting. And you can use it like this. We've been using it already, actually. String implements from for string literals. You can say string.from s1. Then you can define s3 to be s1.into because you get into for free as soon as you implement from. So that's, I'm glossing over these for a reason. And I'm not gonna get into iterators. I wanna get into them next time. I wanna spend some time on iterators because they're pretty cool. But that's the end of my lecture then. Yes, so now you know enough to start programming in Rust. To get started, the Rustlings project is actually brilliant. It's amazing. I recommend you go and do it now. It's basically get the compiler to be happy with the code we've written. And it teaches you a lot about reading code and writing it and how to read error messages that the compiler might give you. I definitely recommend you go check it out. Uh, and if you get stuck, you can ask for help. The Rust community is actually brilliant for, uh, as a source of knowledge, and they're always, they're always happy to help out. I think there's nothing, I don't know what Rust programming is like more, programming in Rust or telling other people about it, hence why I'm here. I'm not doing my WAC coursework, which is in Rust. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the end of my lecture. I'm gonna show you a quick uh, QR code for the Rust server. So you may join 
And if you have any questions while doing the rustlings course, um, there's actually a link. I, I actually didn't make this, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I love that comic Sans font, Charlie. Brilliant. Sorry, it's not a Rick roll. This is a real QR code. I promise. It points to the correct thing. I promise. Oh, I, I don't trust you. Sorry. Risky, risky, risky. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's malware I stored in half a kilobyte of memory. <laughs> I think for that QR code size. But yeah, no, please, please join if you're looking to stop programming Rust.